You're all set. Okay, wonderful. Oh, Gregory's here. <laughs> Hi, Gregory. Anyways, uh, let's, let's begin. I want to thank everybody for joining us, uh, joining us today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you guys are. We've got people from a few, quite a few places around the world. Our topic today is easy and safe pathologist grafting using extracted teeth as bone promoting biomaterials. And I want to thank from the bottom of my heart, Professor Horowitz, who um, graciously agreed to join us today. I think we're in, in for a treat. This is not the first time I've seen uh, Professor Horowitz present, and believe me, it's, it's, un, it's beautiful. It's unbelievable. Um, just a few words to introduce Professor Horowitz. Uh, Bobby Horowitz graduated from Columbia University School of Dental and Oral Surgery in, in 82. Uh, concentrating in periodontics and uh, fixed prosthodontics. He completed a general practice residency and finished two years specialty training program in periodontics at NYU. Uh, he started placing implants back in 85. So there's a lot of experience there. In 96, uh, Dr. Horowitz completed two year fellowship program, uh, implant surgery at NYU. Again, concentrating on bone grafting, bone grafting procedures. As a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Periodontology and Implant Dentistry at NYU, uh, he teaches, conducts research uh, in bone grafting and dental implants. Um, I gotta tell you that any new biomaterial that comes out or came out has crossed Bobby's bench. <laughs> he, he has researched just about any material out there. Uh, he wanted to know uh, 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 everything, everything there is to know about the material before he's using it, before he's teaching it, before he's uh, lecturing about it. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's quite amazing. And any, anything, and anything that's gonna come out in the future, I'm sure is gonna continue to pass to, to Bobby. Uh, he's, by the way, he's an avid skier. He's a music lover, world traveler, and really fun to hang out with. But most of all, I got to say, he's truly passionate about the profession and especially about teaching the next generation. So with that, Bobby, uh, the, floor, the floor is yours. Oh, by the way, just uh, before you start, sorry, just a couple of okay. administrative issues here. Please try to keep your microphones and cameras muted. It's going to help the streaming. And also there is a chat, there's a chat box, there's a chat window. So if you have any questions throughout, just type in your questions. We'll do our best to, to respond. And we're gonna have a Q and A session at the end where we will, uh, you know, we'll try to respond to as many questions as possible. Okay, go ahead. Thanks Amit. Let's get me all set up and let's rock and roll. So good morning, everyone. Wherever in the world you are, um, <clears throat> life is a little changed. So we're lecturing from far away, but with the Q&A during, with the Q&A after, we're going to try and bring this as close to all of you as possible. So as Amit said, I tend to play with everything that comes out on the market. As my IT people say, I tend to be more of the bleeding edge than the leading edge. So I've actually taken five bone graft materials that were released and approved by the FDA off the market. So what I'm going to give you an idea of is what I do whenever I can in my daily practice as a periodontist in the suburbs of New York City in my office. But more importantly than what I do, it's why I do it, the thought processes, the science and the philosophy behind of what I do. So <clears throat> again, it's gonna really be based today about replacing hopeless teeth. And it's not just about filling in a hole. Oh, it's about 
technical issues already. It's about how we regenerate bone. It's not just making something that looks like the shape of bone to drill in, but giving me the biology so I can get osseointegration of living and vital bone that will support an implant that would, if we were discussing perio, would actually support and stabilize a tooth. We, of course, need keratinized tissue around it because, as we know from Linka Vicious's new work, not only do we need the two millimeters of bone that Boozer and Grunder say, but that three millimeters of soft tissue around the implant may even be more important. And we can only do that if we predictably regenerate vital bone, because only vital bone will have the blood supply to support both osseointegration and the soft tissue that we need. And we want to do this in a method that we can afford and our patients can afford. Sure, we could all spend $1,000 for each socket to place bone morphogenetic protein. But as I will show you today, using the Cometa Bio Smart Grinder system, after you finish your initial round of six sites, and that's patients, six patients, no matter how many sockets you do per patient, the next set of as many sites, as many patients as you treat, it's only going to be $50 per patient, no matter how many teeth you extract and no matter how many sites you treat with this material. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to look a little bit at some of the grafts that are available and when I've used them and why I don't use them when I can find dentin. We're going to look at how the body sees them and more importantly, how it doesn't see them. We're going to see what biology is and why it matters to predictably get vital bone in these areas. And again, especially if we look at today in the post or during intra inter-COVID stages, when we're adding $20, $30, $50 $50 of PPE, not including the air filtration, the intraoral evacuation systems, the filtration systems we have to put in our offices that could add $50, $75 per visit, not including the extra time, we have to make our dentistry not only more predictable, but more affordable. And adding biologically based bone grafts that are inexpensive yet predictable may help us make more money and get out of this in a better state as well. And again, just giving you all this biological basis will help you think about future products as well when they come on the market too. So in addition to my clinical work, I do teach. I'm teaching at NYU in a bunch of different departments. And in addition to the teaching, it exposes me to a lot of some of the most brilliant minds around the world. And some of them I'm going to thank right off at the beginning. And first and foremost, I thank, I always thank my brother Ziv. Uh, wherever we travel, whenever we're together, we share, we learn, we talk a few times a week over the phone, share our new ideas. And as the dent and grinder and so many other things Ziv has introduced me to. But who else do I thank? I thank El Caballero, Dr. Pinto, who you've also seen, like you saw Ziv present in this series. Nelson has researched so much. He's, you know, like Ziv, shown us more about platelet-rich fiber and shown us about dentin and things we can do with both. And in the back over Nelson's wine glass, you see Amit. And again, Amit, I thank you for all you've done to not only help me and bring me around the world, but to expose all the people to the smart dent and grinder. But where would we be without all of our professor, without Itzhak, I mean, it's father and the, the developer of the smart dent and grinder. But more than that, a man who's researched at the National Institute of Health, taught for years in Israel, worked in bone biology in New York at the most prestigious medical hospitals and orthopedic centers in the world. And just the kindest, sweetest, most brilliant, most giving man that I know. So in honor and in thanks to all my professors, I tip my head to all of you and let's begin. So whether I'm saving a tooth or replacing a tooth, what am I looking for? I'm looking for the procedures that create the least amount of trauma. Not to me, because the least amount of trauma to me doesn't happen. The least amount of trauma I'm looking for is to the bone and to the gingiva. 
I'm looking for materials that I use, whether they're grafts or barriers that are verified biologically, that histologically we know from the literature and from samples that I take and other people that have taken will show me regeneration of bone, regeneration of keratinized tissue. And when we study it, attachment of these tissues to either dental implants of teeth. For our patients, we need to know that these results, results are clinically applicable and clinically predictable. We don't necessarily get it 100% of the time because there's a variability in sites and in patients and in our techniques as well. But we need to know that in the vast majority of the times, what I show you, what Nelson, what Ziv and what other of the speakers, what Snezana show you, that these are predictable results, not only in our hands, but in all of your hands as well. And that these again, and I'm saying it twice because what we're showing you, you can achieve and you can achieve them on a daily basis. And again, by using materials that are not going to cost you a lot, but that are biologically based, will help you offset the other costs in your office. And again, I don't know about you, but I am spending tens of thousands of dollars getting ready to reopen my office in three weeks in this new post COVID era and saving every penny, especially when we can make it biologically acceptable and verifiable and get even better results is gonna make this even more important. So let's look at bone grafts. We're going to look at how they're similar, how they're different, which is all based on where they come from. The way that they're mineralized, whether they're synthetic or natural, will determine how the body sees them. How the body sees them determines how the body gets rid of them. Certain ones like anorganic bovine bone mineral, and you'll see this from my results and as well as from some of the literature, because they're mineralized to a certain extent, they may never be eliminated from the body. Some people want that because it gives them volume stability of the graft. However, depending on where it is and if the body sees it as foreign, these grafts may be walled off by connective tissue. If there's connective tissue there, there's no blood supply, there are no cells that will give you osseointegration. This could not only prevent the initial stability of your implant, but in the long run, if there's connective tissue in a blood supply, it may lead you more predisposed to losing bone and peri-implant disease. And you're going to see this in one of my own cases. Again, depending on how these materials are handled by the body, may not matter in a healthy patient, may not matter in a young patient. But as we're seeing, especially in COVID, in our patients with comorbidities, these sites that you don't have ideal bone regeneration, where you only have repair, where you only have a material that's surrounded by connective tissue, that may not be the ideal situation for long-term stability in the body. So let's start at the very beginning. After all, nobody really discusses what bone is. We all know what it is. We wouldn't be walking around. I couldn't click my mouse with it. We couldn't hold instruments with it. We couldn't do anything we do with it. So let's think about it. First of all, bone is structural. It's what keeps us upright. It's what holds our organs in place. It's what expands our chest and allows us to breathe. But what else is it? It's mineralized. So not only does it give us strength, but it gives us a reservoir for the most important calcium. And what else is it? It's an organic material. So we know that because when most bone grafts are processed in the body and removed for transplant into other people or other areas, that organic component is removed. Also in ourselves, bone is vital. And depending on when you're grafting and what you're grafting in your patients with, that graft may or may not ever become vital again. For me, I want to see that graft become vital again. I want that graft to have the best chance it can to have living cells and a vascular supply. If your bone graft turns over and is replaced by vital bone, that will give you the best chance to get long-term stability and osteointegration 
of an implant. So again, to me, what is bone? And it's hard to find a definition. So this was compiled from a few different sources. It's a mineralized organic structure that when it accepts a stress will remodel because if it doesn't, what's going to happen is it fractures. And if any of you have gone skiing, played basketball, been in unfortunately a car accident, you know that's exactly what happens when there's too much stress. That bone can fracture. When is that an issue? What happens if you have an implant that's placed in a graft that's not remodeling? If you don't have proper turnover, if you don't have proper blood supply to bring in osteoclasts around a synthetic material, then you may not have the right bone replacement and remodeling around that implant that could lead to failure over the long term. So where does that come in with dentistry? So if we don't have bone homeostasis, then we're not going to be able to get the right nutrient flow, the right antibiotics into a site. If we have an infection, we give the patient systemic antibiotics. We need to have a constant flow of nutrients around our teeth and around our implants to prevent inflammatory diseases from taking place and causing bone loss. Same with osteonecrosis. That happens all over our body. We need the right amount of turnover. So we need osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity to form new bone, replace the dying cells, and to replace the bone that is remodeling. We learned this early on in dental school, and yes, unfortunately, we still need to know it. So let's look at where the bone comes from that we can graft in our body. It comes either from the same or another person, it comes from an animal, or it comes from a laboratory. And we play with all these different types of bone over the years. Let's look at what the body does to it. Depending on where it comes from, depending on if it dissolves, which is what happens to some of the synthetic bone grafts, depending on if it's seen as foreign body and is mineralized and has to be resorbed by osteoclasts, all of these will determine the resorption rate. If it's resorbed or dissolved, then it can leave new space for bone to grow into that structure. If not, if the material is not seen as foreign, then what may happen is the graft may get encapsulated in connective tissue. If it's encapsulated in connective tissue, it cannot be replaced by bone. It does not have a blood supply and you cannot get a good solid attachment by bone to it, which means if it's hit by a drill, if it's hit by a force, that piece can get dislodged and you have no space for osseointegration. You have no space for fibroblast migration along it to get new bone formation if that's happening around a tooth in periodontal treatment. So this is what we need when we're forming bone, whether it's around a tooth, whether it's around an implant, whether it's in a cyst, whether it's in a sinus graft, we need a scaffold, we need a blood supply, we need signals, we need cells. If we get all that in the right places at the right time, we can get bone regeneration. If any of that is missing, and if we don't leave it enough time, we're going to get repair. Repair is going to decrease the predictability of bone formation in the area. And again, this is another way of looking at it. We need osteoclasts to resorb and replace the bone that's in the site or the graft that's in the site to give us the space for osteoblasts to turn on and lay down the new bone formation. So we know from our own patients, we know from literature that some patients heal bone more slowly. We know that some sites, if they're further away from a progenitor source, if they're further away from the bone, if they're further away from a barrier, if there's not a lot of bleeding, that we need more help to form bone. So that's when we add growth factors. That's when we want a more biologic bone graft material. So let's take a patient regular patient who comes in. Is he a good patient? Of course not. If he was a good patient, he would have had tooth number 19 replaced 
at the time it was extracted. He wouldn't have had 18 drift forward. He wouldn't have had all these periodontal issues, all these restorative issues, all the stain. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't be coming in with all of these problems over the years. So, you know, this is a typical patient. Even though my office is in a suburb in Westchester, we end up with physical, physiologic, emotional, and anatomic issues. But these are the kinds of things that you're going to face every day. And you need to solve them also. But you need to solve them predictably and affordably. So let me show you one quick way of doing that. So here we have a patient. Typical issues. Let's get him out of trouble. So what do we need to do? We know we had site collapse on 19. And again, oh, we have to get rid of that D and make that deficient horizontal bone. So we need to preserve the space on 18 so that we can get as much bone and keratinized tissue in the area. We know because of his physical, physiological and financial situations that he can't afford a rage augmentation. So I need to preserve as much bone as he can so that I can get one or two implants in the site. And at 50, there's going to need to be a lot of vital bone because he's going to need this for a long time. So for an atraumatic extraction, we are going to section the tooth. We're going to take it out one root at a time. And because of the large chance of fracture, all of this is going to be done as gently and quickly as possible. So again, as in an atraumatic extraction of a multi-rooted tooth, we're going to section the tooth first, section it horizontally, one millimeter super gingivally. And what we will have done first, because we're going to save all of the tooth structure to use in our smart dentin grinder, we're going to remove any of the restorations, any of the cement, we're going to remove those intraorally. Because while we have our assistant and the suction right there, we're going to use that assistant to make our life easier. So tooth is sectioned. If we need it, we use piezo surgery. If we need it, we make a trough with a very long, thin, tapered carbide burr. And now we have two nice roots. What I'm going to do after the roots are removed, we are going to start preparing everything. for our preparation of the tooth. So now I'm only going to elevate a flap just beyond the crest, just so that in this case, we're going to do a little bit of closure because again, I don't trust this patient. He has a habit of disappearing on me and I want to do a little extra bone grafting to see if I can get a little extra support in the area of 19. So, questions. Do we have to graft? If we leave the area alone, what happens? I know from all the reading of the literature that the best thing for the patient is to put a graft and barrier in. And we can look at lots of literature. This is an article I wrote with Paul Rosen and Danny Holtzclaw. So if you look at only one article, this will give you a good overview of all the literature on atraumatic extraction and site collapse and everything that comes from it. But bottom line is, if you start with a socket and you do nothing, and Ziv and I show this in a study we did on tricalcium phosphate, where we could preserve about 90% of the ridge width. But bottom line is, if you do nothing, Yilma showed you lose 1.35 to two millimeters of height, and you lose 30 to 50% of the width within three to six months. So. Any time you don't graft, you are going to lose that. If you elevate a flap, we know from Fickle and Herzler's work, you have the chance of losing even more bone. So again, in this case, because I'm concerned about the patient disappearing, we did elevate a little bit of a flap. So we took the roots, removed the vast majority of the soft tissue, removed all the restorative materials, and we placed those roots in the smart dentin grinder. What we're going to do is end up in about eight minutes with bioactive graft material. So roots go in, close it. We're going to grind on and off, 10 seconds grind, 10 second grind, 10 second grind, and then sort. I want small, small, small particles, large particles, 
the large particles will help preserve the volume. We have a very thin buckle plate. So I want to keep that volume as long as I can. The small particles will dissolve more quickly and give me a much quicker release of the growth factors. The large particles, again, preserving the volume, longer term release of the growth factors in the area. So we have, with the two particle sizes again, differential release of the growth factors. We also get, with the smart dent and grinder, as you see, the sterile dappen dish. It's one use of all the liquids you need for processing and the sterile grinder and the sterile dappen dish for each time. So what do we do next? We have all particles, mix them together. First thing we do is we cleanse and we sterilize. That's for five minutes. Very, very simple procedure. pH 11, Dr. Pinto has showed us, has done tests on it. This material will then be as sterile as if we had done gamma radiation. What's the big advantage? We have all the growth factors intact. Number one, number two, you don't have to send it out to be sterilized. So what's happening in this processing time? I'll show you. Let's finish your processing first. Now we remove the excess liquid just with sterile gauze. Nothing fancy, nothing expensive. We buffer twice just with the buffered solution, the phosphate buffered saline. That's included with your kit as well. Now, if we want, what we sometimes do is we add a little EDTA. What that's going to do is expose some of the collagen fibrils at the outside edge of the larger particles. Look at it this way. Would you ever do a composite without freeing up, without removing the smear layer? No, it gives you extra surface area for bonding. Similar activity with the EDTA. So, again, removes the smear layer, partial demineralization. So what have we seen so far? Tooth is taken out, we've ground it, and now if we treat it with something like the EDTA, what we see in the literature is we have the ability to even form more bone. So if you want to add that extra two minute step, that gives you a total of eight minutes in processing time. So what do we do in that eight minute processing time? We debride the socket. We take our post-op PA. If we need to elevate any part of a flap for access to debridement, for treating the patient, any adjacent sites, that's when we do it. We start going over the patient's home care instructions. And if we have another few minutes, the assistant gets rid of the elevators, the forceps. Again, Eight minutes is not a lot of time. That's all the time it takes to produce fully sterile, biologically active bone graft. And again, do we need to graft? In my office, I graft every site from one to 32. For the $50 that I'm getting a biologically active graft material, there's absolutely no reason not to. So it prevents your site collapse as you're going to see in every direction and lets you either have an ideal pontic site, ideal site to support a removal restoration, or most importantly, the ideal implant position. And again, if we look at Henry Greenwell's group and any other group, just grafting alone, and this was not a bioactive graft they used, they preserved significantly more volume of the ridge than if there was no grafting done whatsoever. And all the studies show that. So again, in this case, back to our firefighter, placed a barrier, and in this case, again, I did the flap and a little bit of closure because I was concerned that he'd disappear on me because that's what his history is. So remember, originally the buckle plate was down about nine millimeters from the crest of gingiva. No fancy closure, no fancy anything here. At one month, you can see what the healing is like. There was no platelet-rich fiber, no external growth factors, nothing extra added, just the ground tooth. So that's where we started. No keratinized tissue on the mesial buckle, no ridge width whatsoever on the mesial. That's where he ends up in a month.
We have plenty of thick keratinized tissue. We have plenty of height, plenty of width. We have everything that he needed because atraumatic extraction, grafting with a bioactive graft, simple barrier placement, and we've already removed his alveolar ridge height. So in one step, we got everything we needed. I forgot to tell you one thing though. So that extraction was four years ago. What do you think happened to our firefighter? He disappeared. I see him every six months on the train station and he keeps telling me he'll come back. But I know because I used the large particle heavy mix that that volume will be will be maintained. And you'll see in one of the studies why we know that. So now take this patient, typical patient. What do you see where teeth number 18 and 19 were extracted? We see a significant amount of site collapse. You see almost five millimeters of vertical bone loss where those implants are. So now when we have to take out tooth number 20, where there's decay all the way down to the alveolar crest, where we see a very, very thin nerve canal, not ideal for doing root canal treatment, where we see a large periapical pathosis that's almost seven millimeters long, again, not predictable for root canal treatment. Let's see what's the best way to predictably replace that tooth. So only elevating the crest one mil, the flap one millimeter at the crest, just enough to place a barrier in. So you can see how thin the buccal plate and lingual plate are and look at all of our different issues that we have. We're going to do atraumatic extraction and we're going to think about what the most ideal graft and in this case barrier are going to be just to preserve the socket volume and to give me ideal vital bone. And if I need or don't need to add a growth enhancer to the process for her. So again, we're going to look at one of Ziv's and my papers on atraumatic extractions. And again, if you want to look up, that's a good one to look at. Again, flapless when we can because we want to decrease the trauma both to the buccal plate and to the soft tissue. We want to maintain all the blood supply to the buccal and lingual bone. We know again from Fickle and Herzler's work that we're going to decrease bone, we're going to decrease blood supply, and we're going to decrease soft tissue just by elevating a flap. And again, this is from Fickle's study itself. They looked at different treatment groups, and any time they elevated a flap, and you can see the black line is after healing, the purple line is when they started. When they extracted and elevated a flap, they got significantly more bone loss. So again, always try and maintain the soft tissue and use any instrument you can to do the extraction without. They also found that adding a free gingival graft did not help preserve the bone whatsoever. So here's how we started again. That's the tooth with the temporary crown on it. That's what it looks like on x-ray. Again, here are our issues. We know there's a chance of fracture, so we're going to get in and use our piezo surgery. When we elevate a flap, we only do it afterwards because we don't want to get any grinding debris underneath. So as you can see on the left initial, we can see the crown taken off and you can see again when I'm going to use a tooth for dent and grinding, I remove all cement, all restorations, any of that before there's any flap elevation whatsoever. And here on the right you can see the full flapless extraction. Tooth is taken out, socket is debrided, and again on the right, you can see where the molar implants are, the significant amount of site collapse vertically from the prior extractions. So how are we going to preserve the height? Using our bioly, biologically accepted bioactive graft material.
So we want a graph that does have some resorption in it because the more within reason of that graph resorbs, the more space we are going to have for vital bone formation. We do want the large particles to a certain degree based on the thickness and presence of the buccal plate because that's going to help us preserve the volume. Those larger particles are going to act as the scaffold on which new bone forms. And again, as long as we have a tooth there, we're going to get sometimes two to three times its own volume in graft. And there are no shelf life issues. If you have a patient that needs a wisdom tooth extracted, that has periodontal disease, that at some point in the future is going to need grafting or may need extraction of another tooth, take the tooth out, debride all the soft tissue from it, give them the tooth in an autoclave bag. You are not a bone bank. Don't hold on to it. When you're ready to do other grafting, have them come back. You will then process it, sterilize it in eight minutes, and you're ready to go. And again, $50 for all of the sites that you're going to be able to graft with the dent and that you graft from that one tooth or set of teeth that you extract in that one visit. So we use the tooth as the graft. We remove as much of the soft tissue as we can, and you debride all the soft tissue off the tooth with either piezosurgery, a cavitron, a hand scaler, or a high-speed burr. Again, I try and remove as much of the supra gingival restorative materials in the mouth and everything else by hand. Again, do it as quickly and easily as you can. You don't have to worry about all the decay, but remove as much as you can. Now, I always use teeth without gutta percha. I know there are people who use it with gutta percha. My concern is not only removing all of the gutta percha, but I don't know about former cresol. I don't know if whoever did the root canal used former cresol might have left some in there, or if there are any other chemicals in there. I personally am concerned that there might be an issue with any other chemicals in the site. So again, this is my guideline that I won't use a tooth that has a root canal filling in it. If a root canal has been started, but no filling has been done, I have no issue using it and I have not seen any issues, any lesser bone fill with it. Non-vital teeth, it doesn't matter. Infected and abscess doesn't matter because, again, as Dr. Pinto showed us, treating the graft with the pH 11 solution that's included with your kit, you get, again, in the Cometabio Smart Dent and Grinder Kit, you get, just, you get one motor unit, which you will keep forever. This, the single-use package, and you get six of them in a box. Grinder, sterile dappen dish, the sterilizing liquid, the phosphate buffered saline, and at some point in time, the EDTA. With that cleanser, you will fully sterilize any infection, any decay, anything other than the restorative materials. Sometimes with molars, you have to cut the tooth in piece just because it grinds a little easier. So again, tooth goes into or the individual roots or the number of teeth go into the smart dent and grinder. It is sharp, sh sharp and sterile. One or more teeth, single patient, single time use only. Grind. In general, I want more of the small particles. So I'll do three 10 second grinds and then a sort. If I have a fully missing buccal plate, if I'm using a tooth or more than one tooth and doing a ridge augmentation, I'll do grind, sort, grind, sort, because I want more large particles. That's something that will come with experience and based on the size and shape of the defect you're treating. Again, you can see in this case, compared to the last one, more small particles because I have more of an intact buccal plate. I'm more concerned about preserving the height than the ridge width. So I want more small particles so they'll resorb more quickly. 
put the, both particle sizes together. And again, cleanser, buffered saline, and then we have the clean sterile graft, just as we saw before. So what do we have? We have autogenous hydroxyapatite that's bioactive, that hasn't been destroyed, hasn't lost its bioactive components by the gamma radiation sterilization. How do we know it preserves its volume? We look not only at my cases and Nelson's and Ziv's and Schnazana's, but we look at the literature. We look at Nampo's study, which is ideal. So NAMPO looked at controlled sites where they took iliac crest bone, dentin, and no bone graft whatsoever. Why iliac crest? Look at the oral surgery literature. What did they study forever? Iliac crest, the gold standard. Autogenous bone with living cells and growth factors in it. What better to put this against? No negative control, just living vital bone. And they looked at histo, histomorphometry, and everything they could. That's what it looked like initially with the graft and the sham site on the other side. And they looked at micro CT. So what did they see? Critical sites defects didn't fill. What is that to us? When you have a socket and you don't graft it, you lose volume. Again, Fickle, Herzler, look at your own patients that you don't graft. What happens with the iliac crest? It had volume at six weeks, graft resorption at eight weeks. We know that oral surgeons stopped using iliac crest because it's cancellous autogenous bone that just resorbs. What did the dentin graft do? It maintained its volume throughout the study. It forms vital bone and none of those grafts failed. Not one of the dentin grafts failed. So the dentin has every growth factor we need. TGF beta, insulin growth factor, and bone morphogenetic protein. We know that because Marshall Urist found that almost 60 years ago. Cementum has growth factors, even platelet-derived growth factors. So we know that in the control sites, we have no bone formation. Iliac crest bone loses bone, graft loses bone, and the dentin, more bone. We preserved all the ridge width. So we know that dentin has growth factors and preserves the volume better than going to somebody's hip. So we don't have to go to an external site in the body. We get autogenous bone with growth factors from the same tooth we're taking out. So it's exactly what we need. So the smart denting grinder gives us the ability to safely, affordably, sterilely bring the patient's own vital organic bone as a graft to the site where we're working on. And it got rid of the concerns that Nampo raised, which is how do we do this in humans? Itzhak figured out how to do it and Amit is bringing it to us. So here we are, back to our patient. We have our barrier, we place it in the site first. And again, you can see only elevated the flaps enough to tuck the barrier in, no growth factor added. This is just the saline. You can see how the particles hold their shape. Packs easily into the defect and I'm not jumping on it. It's not like I'm trying to pack in a gold foil or amalgam, just putting it in nice and gently to hold the shape, not going for primary closure. That site in the middle that's left open, that's going to keratinize over. That's the advantage of using this PTFE barrier. Nowadays, I'm using amnion chorion barriers in these sites because they work as well, if not even better, because those also are bioactive. We don't have to remove them. We don't have to even elevate a flap at all. We just tuck it right to the very edges. And with the amnion and chorion barriers, we don't have to remove them at three to four weeks either. So you can see I packed a little bit of bone to the distal of the extraction site on the mesial of the implant. That's what it looks like initially, four months and six months. Now, if you look, not only did we preserve all the height in the socket, we even got a little bit extra on the mesial of that anterior implant. So again, Look at the ridge width between site 20 and site 19. 
So 19, if you look from the occlusal, has not only lost the five millimeters of height that we saw in the PA, but it also lost width. Not what we want on a molar site. Molar sites start out at 11 to 12 millimeters wide. You can't even see it under that implant crown where you can see the full ridge width of the premolar site. And look at all that keratinized tissue we have. No, I don't place flapless implants. You could do a guided flapless implant placement here easily. Look at the ridge width. Look at all that keratinized tissue we have on the premolar site compared to the molar sites. Look at how thick and wide that ridge is when we go into place the implant. It's exactly what we need. That's a four millimeter osteotomy with two millimeters of bone on each side and two to three millimeters of keratinized tissue. We meet Boozer and Grunder's two millimeters of bone. We meet Linkovicious's three millimeters of keratinized tissue. From what? Grinding the tooth, which is bioactive, and barrier placement. And again, these days, I would use the Amnion Corian instead of the PTFE. Implant is placed, left in an exposed manner. You can see how it heals. And in the end, look at all that thick keratinized tissue. Implant is restored. That's where we start. That's in the middle. And that's the end. So atraumatic extraction doesn't damage the bone. We use the tooth itself as the biocompatible and bioactive graft, and we got the clinical results we need. We preserve the ridge width. We preserve the ridge height. We got everything we needed nice and simply and easily. Bone was dense enough for drilling, but let's look at the CT. So initially on the left, sections 127 and 128, look at what we started with, 8.1 millimeter ridge width, and look at the final, right when I went to place the implant, 7.9 millimeters. So if we go back to the ISLA paper, they're grafted sites, grafted with human allograft. They started with nine millimeters and ended at 8.2. I think we did a lot better even than they did. So repair is when we put, as my friend Kenny Kurtz would call it, we put gravel in and we put a blanket over it. Regeneration is what we want. We want full, not only physical reconstruction of the site, but we want the original biological activity. We want bone, we want marrow spaces, we want blood vessels. This is my gold standard. So that's again what the site looked like when I went in to place the implant, I used a hollow drill so I could look at the bone. If we used another graft, and this is my good friends Viartzi and Chaim Tal, they used different grafts. This was anorganic bovine bone mineral in a sponsored study. What did they see? They looked histologically to see what the grafts looked like. And only the very, very bright red is living bone on the left side. Everything else is not living vital tissue. Anything else will not form bone to implant contact. So what they found out is only 17% vital bone at nine months. That's not a lot of bone to implant contact. That's not a lot of living cells and blood vessels available to fight peri-implant inflammation. That's no graft resorption at nine months. And if it's not resorbing at nine months, it's not resorbing at nine years or 900 years. This is what we found in Dawn. This is way better bone formation. This is way better bone formation. Woven bone, lamellar bone. Yes, there are some sites where those large particles are still there, but they're fully tightly encapsulated in bone. What do we call that when dentin is fully encapsulated in bone? Ankylosis. The drill will go through it and treat it. And then you'll get osseointegration to the living bone around it. 
you can see where there's new bone formation and vascular supply in it. So we got the clinical result. We got the histologic result we need. We have everything we need with little connective tissue and a living blood supply to get osseointegration and long-term hard and soft tissue stability. So here in the middle of your screen, right under that P, is a lamellar bone system with a blood vessel right in the middle, right next to what's right below that, one of the particles of dentin. So that's ideal biology forming. So again, there's the implant in place radiographically showing the bone height and how it's again much higher than the others. And that's about a two year follow up. So what do we know? We can place this graft to preserve bone. Place, doing just an atraumatic extraction won't and placing an implant doesn't. But we've seen with this material that it will, we've seen that this material is bioactive and gives you ideal bone formation. So let's take a look at my old, old, old friend, Pammy. You can see she's already lost tooth number 30 and look what's happening to 29 and 31. She's allergic to her toothbrush guarantee. But also look at one other quick thing. Look at site 30. You can see this is almost nine months later that graft that's in there is not fully resorbed. And yes, she's going to lose 29. And yes, she's going to lose 31. But I have to leave her something to chew on. Also look, even with the graft that was placed, she's lost height and width. But also look at 29 and 31. She still has inflammation because she's not brushing properly. Look again from the crest. She's lost height and width of both hard and soft tissue. So I need to figure out how to preserve the bone in 31 to do better than I did on site 30. So let's see what we do. There's 30. You can still see graft particles there. We saw the altered mucogingival junction, insufficient keratinized tissue. So to me, that was an unsuccessful graft. But we can get the implant where it needs it because I need to give her something to chew on. And we're going to get it placed buccolingually appropriately, apicocoronally proper, properly, exactly where it needs to go so that she can get the right restoration with the proper emergence profile and restorative space. But again, you don't see the ideal ridge width. So let's move forward, get the implant in place, and look how thin that buckle plate is. Not ideal for long-term success. Look how far apically that bone collapsed again, with a bone graft and barrier placed. So now we have to take out 31. So we're going to use everything we can to take out the tooth, leaving as much of the buccolingual plates intact as possible, but we're going to graft it because I am not placing an immediate socket implant on her. And again, look carefully at the difference in ridge width between the prior graft of 30 and the site of 31. So let's see what we're going to do to protect the site and regenerate the bone in site 31. So let's again look at the literature. We'll look at the schematics. We want to get engraft and barrier in to preserve everything we can in that site. So what are we going to do? Why are we going to use dentin when we can get it? Because what we're going to do is try and get more osteoblasts in the site using the growth factors so that we can get regeneration and get vital bone in there as quickly as possible. We want to get ideal wound healing so that we can get bone on the graft particles. We want to turn on osteogenesis and angiogenesis. We want to use both the small and large particles because if part of the issue is that she's a slow wound healer, 
we need to have that scaffold there long enough around our bioactive graft materials, which have the mineralized component so that we can keep it there while we're waiting for the bone to form. And that's going to happen as our M1 macrophages become M2 macrophages, which are going to turn into our osteoblasts for us. So do we have our biological act, biologically active graft material? And in this case, because as we saw in the x-ray, 31 did not have root canal treatment, we're going to be able to use the dentin. It's the hydroxyapatite with the growth factors like we saw in Nampo's study. And it's going to give us the ability between the collagen and the growth factors to get us everything that we need. It's gonna give us our angiogenesis. It's gonna give us our stem cell recruitment and are going to give, going to give us the vital bone formation that we just saw in Dawn's case. So, we have in PAMI, we have the dentin right there. And with the Cometabio Smart Grinder system, we're going to be able to process this quickly, profitably, and get our bioactive graft material. So tooth comes out. We are going to use, in this case, a very dull cross-cut fissure burr to quickly remove any of the soft tissue from the site. And again, in our smart dent and grinder, we're going to use our single use sterile chamber. We're going to grind it up, get our two different particle sizes. We're going to treat it with our sterile cleanser. And that's going to give us the sterile material with the growth factors. And as you can see, what the cleanser will do will not only clean it, but open up the pores absorb the cleanser and here's from Nelson's study showing how the material is completely sterile. And then we treat it with the phosphate buffered saline and we have our totally bioactive graft just like we showed you already. So again, bioactive is what we need because that will give us regeneration and not repair. So while the graft is being processed, just like I told you, socket is being debride. If we need to flat manipulate, take our x-rays, take our pictures, and your assistant is starting to get rid of all of the, let's call it, tooth removal instruments. Look at how easily that graft material is placed in. Again, no PRF, no PRF block in this case, just plain dentin doesn't wash out, stays where we put it. And had we wanted to, we could extend it with anything if we wanted to do a ridge augmentation, or just in this case, we left it hydrated in the sterile saline. Again, a barrier. Again, this is older cases because I wanted you to see long-term follow-ups, but these days we're using the bioexclude, the amnion corian, because of the bioactivity of it. No primary closure because I wanted more keratinized tissue. And we wait. We wait for bone formation. We may for, wait for some remodeling to occur. And then we have our osteoblasts come in. Then we have our osteoclastic activity. So that was our initial before 230 came out. Our initial graft. Initial graft phase, remodeling, that's where the implant went in. The socket of 31, implant, graft of 31, that's the barrier in place, that's 31 healed. That's with the barrier out. Six months later, look at the height and width of 31 fully preserved and look at all that thick keratinized tissue. So there you see it. The ridge width of number 30 is about six millimeters. The ridge width of 31, just ground dentin in a barrier. Bioactive graft is about 12 millimeters. Plenty of room for a six millimeter wide implant.
implant is placed. Loads of room, dense bone, more width, more height. We have everything we need. I'm going to submerge it here because I'm afraid she's going to chew on it because her home care is horrible. Any other questions about her horrible home care? So four months later, we uncover and we're ready to restore. Look at the thick keratinized tissue. Look at how much better 31 looks than 30. Much thicker ridge width. And you can see once we get a millimeter lower, that ridge is almost 12 millimeters wide. So, other graft, dentin graft. Look at how much thicker the buccal plate is, how much higher we are, further we are from the inferior alveolar nerve. With dentin, we preserved everything we need for long-term stability of the implant. So, again, with the dentin, bioactive graft, even without PRF, even without the bioactive barrier, look what we got. And this is in a poor healer. Posterior mandible, we normally see 20 to 30% vital bone. This is 53% vital bone. By using dentin, we were able to change the biology. The areas you see with the little black hash marks, that's the only particles of dentin that are remaining. All the rest were resorbed and replaced by vital bone. Everything else is living vital bone in this patient. So the first arrow is the blood vessels in the lamellar system. The second arrow you saw the one on the top left, that's the particle of dentin. That's a particle of dentin. And that's a lamellar system. Ideal bone formation. So in the final analysis, we used autogenous living bone, but gotten from a tooth no second sight. It has growth factors. We pick the particle size. It's bioactive. It has everything we need. It's affordable. It's predictable. It gives you everything we want. What do the patients love? They love getting their own back from their own source. They love getting ridge width, ridge height, and ridge volume because the implants go in easily and quickly. Guided, unguided, they don't need secondary grafting when the implants go in. And they get lots and lots of keratinized tissue. What do other studies show? Again, this is another study by Zviartsi and Chaim Tal. Again, with, this is part one of the study with the anorganic bovine bone mineral. This is their pictures from their paper. That's the day the graft was put in. That's the day the graft was uncovered. You can see the graft particles in place. If you see it clinically there, then you know it's histologically there. And if you see it clinically, then you can still, as you see on the bottom left, you know it's there radiographically, and you know on the bottom right that it's there histologically. And if it's there, it's going to have the potential to interfere with osseointegration. To me, I don't want a graft that's going to prevent my patient from getting bone to implant contact, especially a patient that's had periodontal disease, implant failure, caries, a history of medical or medicinal issues, i.e. someone that's lost teeth, someone that has an ability to lose bone or gum around an implant. I don't want to spend a lot of money on that when for $50, I can control the site collapse by getting a vital bone graft in there, one loaded with growth factors right from the same site. I can determine the healing of bone and by choosing the combination of large and small particles, I can decide exactly when I use which ratio. I can follow on x-ray when it's the right time to go in and put in the implant. I know from the literature I've shown you, from the studies that I've published, and Nelson's published, and Shnazana's published, with her beautiful work on CT scans showing bone preservation, that it's going to be in the next time I lecture, because it's a brand new one, that we know we preserve the bone height and width. 
You decide when you take out the tooth and place or not place a graft, what that volume is going to be like. You as the surgeon are going to assist, assist in the success or failure of that case in the future. So you can not only predictably get this, but by using the right graft, you can affordably change your financial picture. So Amit, we are at pretty close to an hour. If you're ready, I think we can open it up to questions and let everybody stretch in the East Coast before lunch or in Europe or anywhere else before dinner. What do you think? Yes, yeah, very good. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Horowitz, thanks very much. Uh, fantastic My presentation. Pleasure. Always, uh, we do have how, we do have many questions. So um, let's let's begin. I think one question that comes up came up three times throughout your lecture is about. Um, is, oh. is, yeah is about, let's see here, it's about, um, you, you showed a number of uh, socket preservation cases. Uh, the question is about what other indications would you use dentin graft? Uh, specifically, there were questions about horizontal augmentations, vertical augmentations, and, 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 um, and intrabony defects. Okay, so the first I was gonna say before you added the long list is if they look at the two of us, you can see we don't use it for hair growth. So that not, not knocks it right off the table. Um, in, in other lectures, I show that I use it for combined defects with periodontal treatment. Um, if I'm taking out a tooth and there is periodontal defect next door, if there's a horizontal or vertical defect next door, absolutely. If it's a predictable vital bone graft loaded with growth factors, I would use it anywhere I can. The issue that comes in is you often run out of material. So if that's the case, I'll use Hamburger Helper and I'll stretch it a little bit with some Cancellus Allograft because I still want the growth factors and all the biological activity of the ground dentin, but I need some extra volume to perform that additional grafting in the adjacent sites. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And we've seen a number of uh, many, many cases uh, using it in the sinuses and uh, uh, augmentations. I think that the, I think, I believe the study you mentioned by Dr. Paul, that last one yes. is really focusing on vertical uh, preservation as well. Um, the, the, there was one quick question here about the cost. I'll, I'll quickly just answer that because it's an easy one for me. Uh, there's a question uh, Dr. Perle, about what does the $50 cover? The $50, that's, in, that's the U.S. price, by the way. In, in other countries, mm -hmm. it's slightly different, varies. But that $50 covers everything you need for that patient, which is that uh, it's the sterile the, uh, grinding chamber. So every time you, you change out the grinding chamber where you actually place the tooth, that whole thing is a disposable, it's sterile, we want to keep everything autogenous. It really, really important. So I get, I do still get questions. Can I use leftovers for other patients? You cannot. Everything we do is sterile. Everything we do is disposable and autogenous. So that whole piece that's disposable, that's part of that kit. The two liquids that Dr. Horowitz mentioned, which is the dentin cleanser and the dentin wash. That's the chemical treatment. Those two bottles are included in the sterile mixing dish. So this whole uh, complex of, of uh, items I just, uh, I just mentioned, that's included in the $50. Now, how much graft would that give you? I'm not sure, doctor, if you mentioned it, but uh, based on what we're seeing, uh, just a couple of examples. Incisor would give you about 0.5 to one, almost one cc graph. Now, a question here about the tooth that you're taking out, the teeth that you're using. So, uh, uh, Bobby, first one, what about the enamel? I know that typically you are including the enamel, so talk about the enamel, talk about the cementum. Are you taking the cementum off? Um, so, uh, 
couple things. Let's go over the tooth before you take it out. Um, if I'm taking out a tooth and there are restorative materials in it, like I said, I will always take out amalgam, composite, cement, any filling material, any crown. I take that out in the mouth first. I want my assistant with her suction. I'm using her because I only have female assistants, not a me too thing. I want them to take all the debris out first. It's easier than me holding and grinding in my hands. Number one. Number two, if there's any enamel, I don't really care because the pH 11 solution will dissolve it. And I find it's easier to do the extraction with the enamel intact than to prep and grind and grind all the enamel off before I do the extraction. As far as the size of the tooth, I think I did mention that often we'll see almost two to three times the volume of the graft material from the size of the tooth itself without giving the specific numbers. Um, I generally don't give the specific numbers because if there's decay, if there's a fracture for sectioning a tooth, you often lose a lot of that tooth volume and it's just hard to give specific numbers relative to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, doctor, I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not uh, mispronouncing uh, your name. Dr. Zafari is asking about cyst, jaw cyst, like mandibular cyst, for example, and what's been our experience. It's funny that, that this question is, uh, just comes up because we're currently submitting a paper that has to do with uh, mandibular cysts uh, and how quickly they heal using dentin. And then the Dr. Kim uh, just responded also to the same, the same question about the cyst using uh, dentin to fill, fill cysts in maxillofacial, man, uh, mandibular, sorry, mandibular, that if you don't have enough dentin, you would mix it with other grafts. What other grafts, um, uh, Bobby, what other grafts would you mix dentin with in case you want to, you mentioned uh, allografts, I think. Uh, can you name specifically what you're using? There was a question about if, if you're not using dent, what is your, your next go-to graph that you typically use? Um, you mean when I'm, when I can't, when I'm taking out a tooth and it has got a percha in it? <laughs> or if you don't have a tooth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I use a lot of mineralized allograft if I don't have teeth to take out. Um, and I'm experimenting with some coral graft from Israel, which is very interesting. Um, using a synthetic graft from South Carolina, which is quite interesting. So I'm still playing with a whole bunch of stuff. But out of all of them, the dentin graft is the only bioactive one. So whenever I can, that's my preferable one. The problem is, as we find in a lot of areas, many of the teeth that we're taking out have had endodontic treatment already. But mm -hmm. okay, there were uh, there were a few questions about membranes. So, mm -hmm. uh, what type of membranes do you use on top of the graft? Do you use membranes on top of the dentin graft? Uh, what can you what can you say about that? Um, so having been trained in membranes and believing in membranes, I personally always, 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 always use a membrane. Um, there is, there are two types of graph materials that I don't use a membrane on, but when I'm using the dentin and when I'm using allograft, I always use membranes. So... I use a lot of the Amnion Corion, the BioExclude these days because it, like the dentin, is bioactive. Again, the reason I didn't show it here because I wanted to show you some of the older cases with longer follow-ups and histology. Um, the BioExclude works very well. Again, bioactive, very well tolerated. You don't need to flap for it. Literally just tuck it right under the edges of the socket. I showed some of the older cases with the dense PTFE 
And the first one I showed was A6+. Plus. Also Israeli, ossifies another very nice membrane to use. Okay. Uh, there was a question about the EDTA that you mentioned. EDTA, we use that as an alternative modality uh, to create partial demineralized dentin graft. So again, our standard modality is mineralized dentin graft, but about two years ago, we introduced a secondary modality for partial demineralized dentin graft. Uh, the question here is, uh, Dr. Horowitz, when would you recommend to use the partial demineralized dentin versus the mineralized dentin? Are there specific indications or specific patients that you would prefer one over the other? Part of that is going to be to defer back to you, Amit, and the company's protocol. What are you advising? What are you including with your kits these days? So the standard kit does not include the EDTA. Uh, that's an extra, okay? That's not, it's not, a, you know, not the major investment. It's just a, another 40 bucks for six patients. So it's, it would add a couple, you know, five bucks per, per case. Maybe. Right. But uh, what we typically say is that when you have patients where you know they're going to be slow healers, so those are the ones that are medicated, the, the smokers, uh, the diabetic, the elderly, you know they're not going to generate bone as, as, as fast as a 20-year-old kid, you know? So uh, those are the ones, those are the, the patients that we like to recommend that partial uh, demineralize because, as you said, uh, you're basically exposing the collagen much, much sooner in the healing process. Uh, and as a result, not just the collagen, with the collagen, of course, you're, you're uh, exposing the BMPs, the growth factors. So what we're seeing that at least in the first stage of the, the first phases of healing, uh, after, after placing the graft, we're seeing even more bone formation happening. In the long term, it's basically stabilizing the same way, right. but it really activating the site, the, you know, the bioactivity of the site a lot more. Yeah, my feeling is that you'll form that initial fibrin clot and it gets attached to the particles more quickly. What I can do, I can look somewhere. I have a slide that shows the, the ASA classification of the poor healers, and I'll get that to you. And that's basically what I go by, is my mm -hmm. patients who I think are going to heal more slowly, those are the ones I use the EDTA on. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Yugi uh, from Canada just uh, says here, why not use EDTA and for every case? And that's definitely an option that you have. It's just mm -hmm. going to yeah. add another two minutes to your protocol. So right. you know, without it, it's about eight minutes long. And with it, it's you, you're adding another Ten. two minutes to it. Definitely worth it. Definitely worth and, it. And to add to that, if I'm doing periodontal treatment with it. So if I'm doing an extraction and graft of a socket and there's a, an infrabony treatment or a recession adjacent, I'll use some of the EDTA to treat the exposed dentin on the adjacent teeth mm -hmm. at the same time. Right, 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 right. Uh, Dr. Kim is asking a couple of interesting questions here. Uh, what, uh, do you dry dentin with a small heater do you need to dry the dentin? To what extent you dry the dentin? Um, and then he's also asking about mixing it with CGF or let's, uh, others were asking about mixing it with PRF. I'll, I'll just quickly answer the drying part and then maybe <clears throat> Dr. Holmes, sure. you can say something about PRF, CGF and how you would use those combined with seeing beautiful results. Uh, by drying the graft, really, you don't really need to dry the graft if you're using it right away. What we really mean is after you use the dentin cleanser, after, let's, okay, going back, you pulverize the tooth using the grinder, and then you use the dentin cleanser where you soak it for five minutes. You basically dehydrate the, the cleanser with the gauze as much as you can. It doesn't have to be dry at all. And then you wash it, and then you wash it with uh, phosphate, phosphate buffers, buffered saline and you once again you dehydrate so that's really uh that's really the process it's very simple it doesn't have to be dry 
The only time when you want the graph to be drier or completely dry is one, if you, if you decide to store it for later use, of course, for the same patient, then in that case, you want to dry the graft and you write, you can definitely use the small heater uh, to do that, or you, use your, you can use your autoclave to dry it and then you can store it indefinitely. But of course, after you label it and, and follow the storage procedures and for the same patient. And also you wanna dry it as much as possible before you mix it up with a PRF if you're trying to create sticky bone. Uh, Dr. Horowitz, if you, I know you've, you've tried it a few times with PRF, mm -hmm. right? Yes, a bunch of times. I didn't, I didn't cover it because I assume my good friend Nelson covered it inside, outside, upwards, and downwards. Yeah, he did. <laughs> so, yes, with PRF, um, good and bad. Good is you get the physical handling of when you get the PRF block to form, it will hold its shape even better. Um, bad is I find that not always does it form the PRF block if it's dent and alone. Sometimes if I add allograft, it forms the PRF more PRF block more predictably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, CGF, CGF I've never used. I've never mixed it with uh, PDGF or any of the other growth factors. Mm -hmm. It's bioactive already. I don't see a point in adding money for other growth factors other than PRF to it. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah. And you saw the histology of it plain and saline. Yeah. Again, that's why, again, knowing and adoring Nelson, I know he would have shown amazing work with PRF and it, and I wanted to just show how it works alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. We'll do a couple more questions and, uh, and, and wrap up. Uh, Dr. Sagar, uh, let's see here, just uh, popped up. Dr. Sagar is asking, uh, is it site or area specific to use the, the denting graft or can we use it in extracted sites or impacted in, in interiors? Anywhere. Uh, my grandmother used to have an expression wherever there's a hole. So I've used it in molars, I've used it in incisors, I've used it in third molars. Uh, we published a paper with Avi and impacted third molars. Mm -hmm. So I've used it in upper incisors. Yeah. I mean, if it's going to preserve bone volume and enhance keratinized tissue, and I'm starting to work on a paper where I have up to nine millimeters of vertical bone growth on periodontally treated teeth, I don't see any place not to use it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Wonderful. Wonderful. So uh, <clears throat> before we wrap up, I just want to make sure everybody's aware of all the different uh, sources for information we have. So if you go to uh, cometabio.com website, it's www.cometabio.com and click on the education tab, uh, you will be able to find uh, lots of studies. Uh, it's amazing how many studies came out on dentin graft over the past 10, 15 years. It's just unbelievable. We, we just looked, we did a survey yet a couple, couple weeks ago and we found over we found like immediately over 90 papers on this topic. So that's, uh, that's one. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. The comment I wanted to make on that is if you compare those studies to ones from most other companies who sell bone grafts, the vast majority of the, si the studies on the Cometa Bio site are not paid for by Cometa Bio. It's done by people like us who believe in the product so fully that we're doing the studies ourselves. And, and I thank you for that. That's great. Yeah. Uh, there was one question that I missed, which is, which keeps repeating itself here. Um, and that's if we can use an infected tooth. Absolutely. We can yeah. definitely use an infected tooth. I mean, you saw that, you saw that that's with right. Dawn's lower molar with, Dawn's premolar, you saw with Pammy's lower molar. Both of those were infected. And that's the strength of the dentin cleanser. It really wipes out anything, all the infection off it, 
you know, once you apply it for five minutes and you soak the graft in it. So that's really, really does a great job as far as the heavy lifting of any bacteria uh, and any remaining decay in the tooth. So no, no problem whatsoever. So again, I talked about where to find resources. There are cases on the website, there's research, the studies, and there's more about the product. Uh, with that, uh, there are comments coming in, very informative. People are thanking you, Dr. Horowitz. What fantastic webinar, uh, Dr. Kurtzman is saying. Uh, so uh, wonderful feedback. Uh, Dr. Horowitz, once again, I thank you very much. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm sure people can write to you directly or write to Absolutely. us. Info at cometabio.com. We'll be more than happy to respond. And we will send out links to this uh, wonderful video uh, as we're recording it. All right? Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.